Are you able to hear me, please? Yes, sir. Able to hear you. Able to hear. Okay. Any slight change? Okay. Come on, get this. Light tower I change for the other part in other. Here, I ought to get enlarged for them. Sir, I'm a start. I'm a start. I'm a start. Share for the attention. Me, so simple, Jimmy. I'm a start. 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 Hello? Yes, sir, I am just reconnecting again. Eh? Okay, okay. Yes, sir. Hello. You are able to hear me now? Yes, yes. मिस्टर अशिम यस मैंने आपको एक साइट वाला भी दिया हुआ था वो वाला इमेज खोल लीजिए जिसमें तीनों डॉक्टर एक साथ दिखते हैं यस yes. ये वाला तो इनवाइट का था डिजाइन mm -hmm. वो अच्छा लगेगा व्हाट्सएप पे भी होगा आपके शायद व्हाट्सएप से आई कंसर्न व्हाट सी आपके पास yes. Yes. मैंने आपको एक साइट वाला भी दिया हुआ था वो वाला इमेज खोल लीजिए जिसमें तीनों डॉक्टर एक साथ दिखते हैं yes. ये वाला
এটা শুধু আমারটাই আসছে ওরা আসছে না ওদেরই নাকি না ওটা স্ক্রিন শেয়ার করছে কিন্তু বলছে হ্যাঁ শুরু হয়নি হ্যাঁ শুরু হয়নি अशीम जी व्हाट्सएप वेब से आप डाउनलोड कर सकते हो जल्दी से वैसे ट्राई कर रहा हूँ नहीं तो मैं आपको मेल कर रहा हूँ अभी दो मिनट में I have sent you on mail. Asim, I have sent you on mail. Okay, okay, I'm checking now. Just see here. Gmail se bheja hai maine. Ashim, I am say, uh, sharing it. If you have not got it, uh, mail of the mail mailbox पे आया नहीं अभी. मैं share कर देता हूँ. Don't worry. Okay. I am sharing it. Hello. हाँ बोलिए ना. मैं लिंक मेल कर देता कर देता हूँ ठीक ठीक ओके Can we? Uh, 
uh, we can start now. So, uh, uh, all Pradeep sir, Agarwal sir, and Madhav sir, can we start yes. now? Yes, yes, we can start. Yes, we can start. We can start. Pradeep ji, can I start? Yes, go ahead. Okay, okay. Good evening, sir. Myself, Ashim, uh, RBM working for IFCA, based at Guwahati, sir. So, in this current situation, unable to do any CME, unlike before. So, this is a new platform for all of us. So, I, I would like to welcome all of you at the VR of IFCA, sir. So, uh, today, I mean, uh, there are three doctors over there. Uh, so, first, I'm going to our chairperson, Dr. Pradeep Kumar Jain. He is from Infal, Manipur. Uh, he is a senior physician and also practicing dermatologist. So he will chair the session today. And two more speakers from one from Malda, Dr. Vijay Agarwala. So he is also consulting physician and cardiologist practicing. Uh, and he is also from, uh, no need to interaction because all doctors in Malda know him. And apart from that, Dr. Madhamisha sir from King Chukia. He is also practicing as a consultant physician, dermatologist also. So all three senior doctors. Uh, Again, sir, welcome. And so, over to Dr. BKJ. Pradeep, sir, your bike is muted. Jain, sir, your mic yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Asim. So, here today we have two very good speakers, Dr. B.D. Agarwal and Dr. Madhav Mishra. They will be covering two topics, inflammation and type 2 diabetes. And second will be hydroxychloroquine. So I think it will be a very good interaction in this COVID era where we have to be isolated from all. We can't be together, but in such a platform, we are all together. So I think, Doctor, we can start our webinar. And now, Dr. B.D. Agarwal or Dr. Madhav Mishra, you can start your topic. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Today, topic assigned to me is inflammation and type 2 diabetes. What is the link behind inflammation and type 2 diabetes? Can you share the slide, please? Yes, sir. Uh, it's not being seen in the... Yes, I'm going to share it. So, diabetes, as we know, has a multifactorial disease in which uh, autoimmunity, genetics, environmental, infective, and even inflammatory plays a role. So, today, we are more stressing upon this fact, how does inflammation play a role in the uh, causation of diabetes? Next slide. Inflammation, as we know, uh, all the features of heat, pelt, redness, swelling, loss of function, these are all common functions of uh, types of and the symptoms of inflammation. Next slide. Inflammation may be acute and chronic. Acute uh, in the cause of bacteria, virus, and mostly the mediators are the polymorphonuclear means, and the mediators are uh, histamines, bradykinins, the vasoactive amines. But today we are concerned more with the chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation, the major events, the mediators are the cytokines, the ROS, the enzymes. Although it's a delayed onset, but there is a tissue dis destruction. Next slide. So how does inflammation play a role in this causation of diabetes and the vascular diseases? Well, way back in 1876, Epstein, he showed that sodium salicylate, when used in a patient, it decreases the blood glucose level. It was in 1876. And again in 1952, Jocelyn et al. showed that rheumatic fever and diabetes have a very less coexistence, rarely coexisting, because rheumatic fever patients is taking sodium salicylate. And that's why the, and the incidence of uh, diabetes is less common in those rheumatic fever patients. Naturally, there is a link between inflammation and diabetes. Next slide. Now, chronic inflammation, 
inflammation what happens and is important role it it leads to in it, that leads to the insulin resistance in the diabetes especially in the obese patients and also the impaired insulin secretion and the vascular complications now the major cytokines which play a role are the tnf alpha interleukin 1 interleukin 6 these are the major cytokines and these when again leads to the, the activation of nfkb nfkb and the serine ikkb these are the two serine kinase enzymes they are activated by the fatty acid fatty active fatty acid dependent activation of serine kinase of the two enzymes ikkb and nfkb and these play a key role in the nfkb this plays a key role in the tissue inflammation and ultimately in the causation of diabetes by due, due to the insulin resistance next slide now we have seen that in indians there's an earlier onset of uh, diabetes this is a very old slide and here it shows that in 2000 the incidence of diabetes was this uh, normal chart and the, the inter intermittent graph shows the in uh, incidence of diabetes in 2004 that means as the age uh, the incidence of diabetes is decreasing in the uh, age and the younger age patients are having diabetes next slide especially in the asians and we in indians there's a two to three fold higher incidence of insulin resistance as compared to the other groups and that is why more incidence of diabetes among indians and diabetes develops at a younger age in indians at least a decade or two earlier as compared to the europeans and even the migrant indians they have been found to have a higher prevalence of coronary disease and mortality as compared to the uh, those in the european population the so indians who have migrated to the european countries they, there it is also found that the incidence of coronary disease is more amongst them so it's a ethnic group due to and we asians are more prone to have a, a, this diabetes and that's why india becoming the diabetes capital of the world next slide now this is a very old slide a very popular one and i think all of us have seen this slide in different uh, discussions it's uh, published in the way back in 2004 here it says that uh, in way back in 2004 it was seen now what happens the two indian and the uh, european having the same bmi of 22.3 i this is a very famous doctor of pune i forgetting the name and uh, here it was found that the body fat content although their bmi was the same the body fat content in the european was only 9.1% whereas in indian population indian person it was 21% so here it shows that is what the thin fat indian that means an indian although looking thin but his visceral fat is much higher as compared to the other population next slide Here it shows the European phenotype and the Indian phenotype, the cross-sectional mass, and ultimately it is found that the visceral mass, visceral adip, is much higher in case of Indians. Next slide. Uh, adipose tissue, that is considered to be the storehouse of energy metabolism. Now, adipose tissue is cons uh, is having two types: white and brown. White adipose tissue and brown adipose tissue. the white adipose tissue is benefit they are the storehouse of energy so what happens when there is a uh, in the brown adipose tissue there is a chronic inflammation this visceral adipose tissue is a seat of chronic low grade inflammation the kimerin and adipokinin initiates the inflammation by recruiting the dendritic cells into the visceral adipose tissue and thereby in polarization of the macrophages and uh, this uh, uh, there are two types of adipokines here the beneficial adipokines are adenopectin leptin apilin igf1 and bistafen whereas the infl pro inflammatory cytokines are the resistin tnf alpha interleukin 1 interleukin 6 these are the mediators of these are the mediators in the inflammation 
Now, this chronic low-grade inflammation is continuing in the adipose tissue, ultimately leading to the insulin resistance. That is the causation. Here it shows adipose tissue and systemic insulin resistance leading to more diabetes. So, the adipose tissue, there is a chronic inflammation going on and in which these TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, resistance, these are the principal cytokines involved in that event. Next. Now, diabetes, the two main causes are insulin resistance and insulin insufficiency. How inflammation play, contributes in both the events? Here it shows then when, when there's a high metabolic load, when there's excessive calorie intake, this calorie is stored in the adipose tissue. And as early just discussed, in the adipose tissue, the chronic inflammation uh, uh, continues with the help of this NK4, CD4, CD8. These enzymes are involved and this leads to hyperplasia of this adipocyte and uh, the insulin resistance is the causation for this. As a result of insulin resistance, the insulin is not being uh, working there and that's why a higher demand for insulin occurs. And when there's a higher demand for insulin, there's more stress on the pancreatic beta cells. Now, at the same time, this, due to this high increased fatty, due to the high increased fatty acids, fatty, free fatty acids, increased leptin, there's an oxidative stress in the beta cells also. There is a cytokine production, immune cell reaction, and ultimately, the beta cells, the islet cells, also get dysfunction and inflammation, due to which there is an insufficiency of insulin secretion. So here we see in this chart that inflammation plays a role as to how it contributes in causing the insulin resistance. And secondly, how this insulin, uh, this uh, inflammation ultimately also affects the beta cells the islet cells and they're causing the insulin insufficiency and both contributing to the causation of diabetes. Next. Not only the diabetes, also the vascular complications. That, are, that is also linked with the uh, inflammation as we here see the macrovascular complications, the cardiovascular, cerebrovascular and the peripheral arteries all being involved due to this insulin resistance and uh, uh, this uh, in chronic inflammation going on due to the formation of the free fatty acids from the uh, adipose tissue. Next. Here is the chart shows how the microvascular complications, the nephropathy, retinopathy, and neuropathy, how it is being affected due to the hyperglycemia, the, uh, where the inflammation plays a role in hyperglycemia and hyperlipidemia. There's an oxidative stress so leading to the inflammatory signaling cascades as we have seen the different uh, cytokines involved in the inflammation. And as a result, this, uh, of this uh, cytokine inflammatory reaction, these occur in the nephropathy, causation of nephropathy, retinopathy, and neuropathy. There are the different sites, the, uh, immune, the inflammatory reactions are being continuing at a very chronic low-grade level. Next. So here we see the potential markers of the chronic low-grade inflammation, the WBC count, the serum cytokine markers, as we said, the TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, interleukin-10, HSCRP, C-reactive protein. Now, this is a very important marker for the uh, inflammatory reaction, and it also it has been found that in the diabetics, the, num the CRP level is found to be uh, higher. Even the immune cell markers, increase in CD4 and CD8 T cells have been found to be linked with this chronic low blood inflammation. Adipokines, adipokines as we have seen, we'll come discuss on the next, next slide. The potential, here it says the different studies which have been conducted to study the CRP level and the diabetes. Here you see the Pradhan et al, Although the number of cases are less, if Pozan et al, the new number of cases of diabetes is 188 for follow up for four years, and it has been found that CRP level, it was a baseline, it was found to be associated with uh, incidence of diabetes. Similarly, other studies have shown even this uh, Lindsay et al, he did a person in 70 persons in which he studied regarding adenopectin, which I was telling. 
adenopectin is a beneficial uh, enzyme so this uh, there are, there are two uh, and cytokines available in the adipose tissue the beneficial adipokines and the inflammatory cytokines the beneficial adipokines are the adenopectin leptin epilin igf1 vistafil these are the various beneficial adipokines of which adiponectin is a prominent one and here it shows that lindsay et al studied the relation of adenopectin with uh, diabetes and if the adenopectin level is high the incidence of diabetes is less so this is adenopectin just like uh, i mean say uh, this uh, <clears throat> sdl in which sdl is beneficial for our cardi similarly adenopectin if it is high the incidence of diabetes is less next here it shows a meta analysis of 19 studies in which they have found that whenever the crp level is high the tnf factor alpha il interleukin 1 interleukin 6 these incidences have been found to be higher incidence of uh, diabetes and here it shows that low levels of adenopectin low level of adenopectin has increased risk of diabetes which I, which i was saying that adenopectin is a beneficial one here it says that adipocytokine biomarkers are predictors of diabetes and should probably measured to level the target and the interventions next the crp which we are doing it regularly this is a uh, have been found to be much associated with the uh, this is known for inflammation and it has been found that in type 2 diabetes there is a strong association between the level of crp and the incidence of diabetes here in the study conducted by west of scotland coronary prevention study they have studied on this c reactive protein as a independent predictor for the development of diabetes and they what have found in different years different long duration of study and they have found that high crp level more than 4.18 is associated with more than three fold incidence risk of developing diabetes so if a, if we do a crp level of a person in otherwise a normal person in if we find an a higher crp level and we do not find any cause of this high crp then this may be indicator that this person shall be developing diabetes next here it shows the hs crp and the incidence of diabetes among patients with diabetes increasing percentiles of hs crp at baseline is associated with an increased risk of developing diabetes at a follow up of 3 to 4 years we have found this chart graph next now the different mediators of inflammation in the progression of diabetes as we studied the crp level the interleukin 1 interleukin 6 here the interleukin 6 has been studied and they have found that in uh, normal persons the level is less but it is higher in impaired fasting glucose and much higher in case of hyperglycemia here this chart regarding was crp as we have studied next then here it shows not only the diabet level of diabetes even the vascular complications have been found to be more with higher crp levels here are the two subgroups of a and b as they were studied in this subgroup a the crp was less than 3 and in the subgroup b the level of crp was more than 3 now here is found that in the subgroup a in male and female the incidence of having cardiovascular events it this was the incidence and next uh, this was the incidence in the males and the females also it is found that when the level is the crp is more than 3 the incidence of cardiovascular is much high you see this is less than 3 and this is more than 3 the incidence of cardiovascular complication is more in male similarly in female also the incidence this is the incidence in of having less than crp less than 3 and when it is more than 3 here is the incidence of the cardiovascular complications so crp having a relation not only in the causation of diabetes also in its associated complications the cardiovascular complications as a relation to it and the level of crp has been found to be uh, associated with it and thus signifies an association of inflammation and diabetes next 
here the HR, uh, HR CRP level and the CV risk marker in the different metabolic syndrome is same thing when it is less than three and more than three, the different studies. This was then a woman health study. Next. So the chart, a graph has been linking the BMI level, the HbA1c and the HSCRP level. And here it, the graph shows that uh, persons having higher CRP have more incidence of diabetes, especially in a higher BMI group. So the three uh, chart has been done concurrently. Next. White blood cell count, as we know, is the, uh, it'll be high in any inflammation. So it has been found that even the white blood cell count is associated with the worsening of the insulin sensitivity and it predicts the type 2 diabetes. So if you have a person having a higher WBC count with no many other cause, if you don't get any other cause for that particular uh, WBC high count, that you may suspect that this may be a person most liable to have diabetes. And here is the, chart, the study it shows that uh, persons having a higher blood count, in the follow-up study, they have found that they are having a greater incidence of diabetes. Next. Yeah, the baseline, the, in this study, the baseline conduction was that WBC was more than 6,900, and that was an, they had an independent 52% increased risk of diabetes. You see, the WBC count more than 6,900, and an independent 52% increase in the diabetes risk. So WBC count, CRP level, TNF factor, interleukin-1, if these levels are high, then there are chances that the patient must be developing diabetes in a recent time. Next. Relationship. So we see the relationship between WBC count, the CRP level, and the metabolic syndrome. They, is, this is in the different ethnic groups and the Caucasians and the uh, African American groups. And these are the, this is for the WBC count. This is for the uh, CRP level. And con and both have been combined. That this is the chart. So there is a higher incidence, especially in our Indian population. Next. Adenopectin, as I have told, it's a beneficiary one. Adenopectin, when it is high, it will there is a less chance of developing the uh, this metabolic complications of uh, uh, meta adenopectin possesses an anti-hyperglycemic, anti-atherogenic, and anti-inflammatory properties. So if baseline, here it shows that if baseline adenopectin levels are higher, the progression of diabetes is slower. So measurement of this adenopectin is also a good one. It is found that uh, in, if the baseline adenopectin is high, the incidence of uh, diabetes is less. And especially uh, this chart here it shows that changes in the adenopectin level. This adenopectin level is found to more if the patient is having a healthy lifestyle. <coughs> so <clears throat> on the other hand, so adenopectin or drugs that stimulate adenopectin might be have, playing a role in the treatment of diabetes by S chart because adenopectin has a beneficial effect. Next. Next slide, please. Hello. One second, sir. Start the stuff. We are now. Yes. And as you have seen, the different factors, the uh, CRP level, the interleukin-1, the white blood count, um, WBC count, and here again the tumor necrosis factor. It shows that tumor necrosis factor alpha is an elevated in adipose tissue where, where the chronic inflammatory process is going on. So tumor necrosis factor in the res insulin resistance in the obese people that is causing diabetes. Here it shows that uh, if the tumor, tumor uh, TNF factor alpha is decreased, is less than the chances of uh, insulin sensitivity is more. Neutralizing, here it shows that neutralizing of TNF factor alpha in one of these models improves insulin sensitivity by increasing the activity of insulin receptor tyrosine kinase 
especially in the muscle and fat so all these factors if we the inflammatory reagents you see that if together all of these are higher then that indicates chances of developing diabetes thereby showing a link of inflammation with diabetes diabetes as we have discussed has all the roles of autoimmune genetic environmental but today we have been discussing on how inflammation also plays a major role in the causation of diabetes next here are the different journals where, where they have studied and found the inflammatory disease leading to insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction you see in jama in 2001 c reactive protein interleukin 6 and risk of developing diabetes this is the study in published in 2001 similarly here it shows inflammation the link between insulin resistance obesity and diabetes this was in uh, type 2 diabetes as an inflammatory disease so and way back in chronic inflammatory role in the obese diabetic associations so these are the different studies where they have uh, linked inflammation with diabetes next so although we are um, suspecting that uh, inflammation does have a major role in uh, this uh, formation of diet diabetes but there are some unanswered questions in the future which we, more studies have to be done it is the what is the relative contribution of inflammation for diabetes how much it is affecting secondly how does uh, anti inflammatory uh, agents how does it really work In, in diabetes how does salicylate really work in diabetes <laughs> thirdly how efficacious and durable are these anti inflammatory approach for the diabetes these studies have to be done and also if we start uh, treatment with this uh, anti inflammatory agents how will it help in preventing the progression or the overt manifestations of diabetes these have to be done in the way in the future studies and in we know there's all anti diabetic drugs the thiazolidinones the glp1 agonists the tp4 inhibitor and insulin they, they do have an established anti inflammatory effect these all these drugs which we are using as a for anti diabetic they have an anti inflammatory action also and therefore and uh, we know that adipokines have a potential therapeutic application so considering all of this there's the abundant clinical evidence that systemic inflammation does have a role in causation of the insulin resistance to diabetes obesity and beta dis beta cell dysfunction and ultimately the all the parts of metabolic syndrome thank you next thank you Thank you, Dr. Agarwala. Now I request Dr. Madhav Mishra to present his topic. Okay. And regarding question and answer, we can do after completing the session. Okay. Good. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Now, hydroxychloroquine. the name itself is a hot topic nowadays in the covid era because of the whole list who listed it as a essential medicine the list of essential medicine includes hydroxychloroquine sir can you Last share your presentation big, uh, dr madhav can you share your presentation please yes yeah, i'm just... sharing i am sharing so we are not getting it can you please share it uh, on the share screen just click there like you have done earlier hmm. ashim can you run the uh, yes, presentation yes. Madhav, for Madhav, sir, can, can i share the slide for you No, I am sharing. You are not getting it, no? It's not no, visible sir, on the screen, actually, sir. You are not getting it. 
It is not shown to you. Sir, click no, no. on the share screen and yeah. select the PPT. और फिर शेयर कर दीजिए नीचे बॉटम देर विल बी वन ऑप्शन इट इज नॉट शोन हियर स्क्रीन शेयर they are not getting yes sir getting now yes sir just yes, click sir. on slide yes 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 sir are getting Yes yes. yes 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 so good evening to you all if the term hydroxychloroquine is a controversial subject in this covid era it is a list of essential medicine from who but of late the who has discontinued hydroxychloroquine in the treatment of covid 19 and prevention of covid 19 of late but our subject is defined one the role of hydroxychloroquine in type 2 dm we have got robust evidences in favor of treatment of type 2 di diabetes with hydroxychloroquine the historical aspect the first us fda approval is 1955 predominant use in rheumatoid arthritis in the past we are using it for a long time in rheumatic arthritis hydroxychloroquine fishers in the who essential list of medicines in 2011 rheumatoid arthritis we are using it in 2006 in polymorphic light eruptions in 2008 in lupus erythematosus and from 2014 exactly exactly say 6 years back diabetes in the treatment of diabetes mellitus hydroxychloroquine is added as a third line agent this is 28 july 2000 for me hydroxychloroquine is indicated as an adjunct to diet and exercise to improve glycemic control of patients of metformin sulfonylurea combination in type 2 diabetes how does it act mechanism of action of hydroxychloroquine so it going into to diabetes first is inhibition of insulin degradation number 2 is reduction in inflammation number 3 is improves insulin sensitivity number 4 is beta cell preservation first to go one by one inhibition of insulin degradation how it does insulin degradation part way we are showing insulin binds to its receptor on cell membrane then internalization of receptor insulin complex into endocytic vesicle insulin dissociation from its receptor insulin degradation by id in acidic environment half life of insulin for Four to six minutes. Receptor recycled to the cell surface. Next is reduction in inflammation. This subject is already discussed by Dr. Agola as previous speaker. I am showing a hydroxychloroquine reduces CRP levels. That is evidently shown by Dr. Agola. Number three, improved insulin sensitivity. come to in sensitizer so in case of insulin resistance it acts and last but not the least is beta cell preservation beta cell preservation is a essential prerequisite for a for a hypoglycemic drug if you you can preserve the beta cell it is always helpful 
to preserve the pita cells. A total of 45 rats were divided equally into controlled diabetes mellitus and hydroxychloroquine plus diabetes mellitus groups. The ASTQ plus DM group preservation of islets of Langa and Sopoxtar significantly increased in the beta cell mass, IOL proliferation and neogenesis, and correction of the significantly increased alpha cell mass also. Lowering of pancreatic levels of IL, non beta, TNF alpha, and TGF beta 1. This is diabetic diagrammatic representation of the preservation of the beta cell with HTQ treated patient. It is shown. In clinical evidence, we are already discussing about evidences in favor of hydroxychloroquine. It, we have got international studies, Indian studies, observational studies, and case reports. Regarding international studies, at quarter at KAL, prospective study in 1990, after six months, it has shown improvements in other studies, Garstein HD et al. International study of 2018. This is randomized double blind passive control trial of hydroxychloroquine versus placebo. Patient characteristic is V1C more than 8%. Weight more than 60 kg, type 2 DM for 12 months, inadequately controlled by metformin, 1500 milligram, and glamipirate, 400 milligram day. Third line agent, hydroxychloroquine, 400 milligram OD, or placebo for six months. It is shown in the hydroxychloroquine parameters compared to placebo. It is definite improvement in the glycemic control. FPBG, PPBG, and HB1C. Everywhere there is definite improvement. Head to head conclusion of hydroxychloroquine with bioglitazone and third line agent in type 2. Patients with baseline HB1C levels of 7.5 to 11% with maximum tolerated doses of metformin and sulfonyl. Third line agent, HCQ400 or pyoglitazine in 14 milli 45 milligram days. Both drugs were well tolerated and significantly improved. Hydroxychloroquine 400 milligram reduced HB1C level by 1.2 percent versus 2.8 percent with pyoglitazine in 45 milligrams. But pyo caused significant weight gain and so Water retention is very common it, because of the side effects, hydroxychloroquine is preferable. Efficacy and safety of hydroxychloroquine in the treatment of type 2 diabetes mellitus. First Indian clinical trial. Hydroxychloroquine shows decrease in FBG, PPG, and ASB1. Change from baseline it is seen after 24 weeks, there is definitely change from baseline of both FPG, PPG, including HB1C. Hydroxychloroquine in type 2 diabetes, this is an observational study only, real life effectiveness and tolerability of hydroxychloroquine in type 2 diabetes. Good tolerability. None of the patients discontinued drug during the course of the treatment owing to side effects. There is definite fasting, PP, and HB1C reduction. There is a study hydroxychloroquine versus canagliposine in real world setting. Study designed is multi center randomized parallel group, open level study. It has also seen glycemic and safety parameters were evaluated, randomized to receive hydroxychloroquine for 100 
as against kana glucosin 300 mg for 24 weeks in real world setting efficacy and safety of hydroxychloroquine was at par with kana glucosin so with as realty and future also we are showing the good results with this study real world effectiveness and tolerability of hydroxychloroquine for 100 mg in type 2 diabetes out of 250 patients of 18 to 65 years group uncontrolled type 2 diabetes on metformin plus sulfonylurea were prescribed hydroxychloroquine for 100 mg or for 48 weeks drugs used as follows metformin 2000 mg 100% Glamipride 4 mg, pyogrelin 30 mg, citagliptin 100 mg, canagliprozin 300 mg, and EMPA is 25 mg. Change in glycemic parameters and HSCRP was evaluated at 12, 24, and 48 weeks. In the real world effectiveness and tolerability of hydroxychloroquine 400 mg in type 2 diabetes more reduction in glycemic parameters and body weight was observed among the patients with higher hsgrp compared to patient with baseline hsgrp most common and worst even reported with drug therapy was gi irritation 3.6% and hypoglycemia none of the patient required medical assistance for The conclusion comes as HCQ effect will be improved glycemic control in C2DM patients and controlled on multiple anti-diabetic drugs. It may emerge a viable therapeutic intervention for the patients with C2DM. There are other studies. Hydroxychloroquine add on to basal insulin, metformin, citagliptin. Some patients are not controlled with insulin. metformin citagliptin in those cases we can add hydroxychloroquine add on therapy of hcqs significantly improved glycemic control in patients with poor control type 2 diabetes this is safety and efficacy of 52 weeks therapy with hydroxychloroquine first anti inflammatory drug approved in india for type 2 diabetes Study enrolled 600 P2DM patients. Uncontrolled, uncontrolled, that is more than HBA-C7 percent on metformin plus HC combination. Received add-on hydroxychloroquine for 50 weeks. 100 high patients completed 24 weeks and 234 completed 52 weeks of study. Till date, for analysis, patients were divided based on baseline HSGRP. Less than three and more than three. H C Q four hundred in patients with poorly controlled insulin treated diabetes. This is open level parallel group retrospective and multi central observational study. This is the observational study only with poorly controlled type two diabetes on basal insulin glycine with other or A C therapy metformin plus citagliptin. 100 mg daily metformin 1 g daily in those cases we are adding hydroxychloroquine 400 mg addition to insulin and results are shown to poorly control insulin treated diabetes and administration of hcq 400 resulted in sustained improvement in glycemic control when given as an adjunct to insulin therapy in patients with poorly controlled type 2 This is also in uncontrolled type 2 DM patients. Dual therapy of metformin and sulfonylurea. Prospective observational study. Uncontrolled on a combination of two OHs with a BMC more than 7.5 percent, body weight more than 60 kg, received add-on hydroxychloroquine for 100 mg once daily for 24 weeks. Results are again shown at 24 weeks. There are definite reduction. In HB1C and fasting and fifty, hydroxychloroquine may emerge as a valuable therapeutic intervention for patients on control on two OHs.
add on to type 2 DM patients controlled with oral drug combination and then this is 72 weeks multicenter observational trial. T2 DM patients with inadequate glycemic control on diet, exercise, and combination of metformin and sulfonyl. T2 DM at diagnosis 2.62 plus 1.2 years, baseline HB1 8.1%, baseline HSCRP 2.7 milligram per DL, add on treatment HCQ4. What we have seen daily insulin dose. FPG, PPG, ACSCRP. FPG, TSTQ exerted good glycemic control along with 26% reduction of daily insulin dose. At the end of 72 weeks, it also reduced inflammatory load. Not a single eye has developed retinopathy of any grade. This is in reference to IDF, International Diabetic Federation of Two. Congress 2019. An observational comparative study of efficacy and safety of hydroxychloroquine and dapagliflozin in uncontrolled type 2 diabetic patients. This is STQ versus dapagliflozin in T2DM patients under uncontrolled on insulin plus gamipride type metformin. In 24 weeks observational multicentric study. Selected HB1C more than 8.5% on stable treatment with insulin, including 30 units daily, glamipirate 4 mg daily, and metformin 1000 mg daily for at least three months prior to inclusion. They are receiving add on HCQ400 or DAPA 10 mg. This combination shows. Change in HB1C, change in daily insulin. HB1C reduction by HCQ was significantly greater than DAPA. There's a confirmed hypoglycemic event, so significantly less compared to DAPA. No severe hypoglycemia was reported with any of these particles. Reduction in body weight, 2.1 kg with HCQ and 1.9 kg with DAPA. So significantly better. In the HDQ group. Recent ADA, the virtual ADA, hydroxychloroquine in T2 diabetic, is studied uncontrolled on two or more OSAs with or without insulin. 51 received statins and 30 on antihypertensive therapy. A1C reduced by 1.05% at week 24. Total cholesterol and LDL also reduced with HTQ weakness. Mean body weight reduced from 73.59 kg at baseline to 72.84 kg. No cases of HTQ induced retinopathy in any of the patients followed till 52 weeks. One patient was detected with mild non polyperative diabetic retinopathy at week 12, and drug is continued. Of the 12 days reported, 11 were mild in intensity and unlikely related to HCQ. No incidence of derangement in hepatic or renal biomarkers. Largest clinical data of HCQ in type 2 DNA. The improvement in lipid profile is also shown with the help of hydroxychloroquine. These figures have shown LDL, HDL, non-HDL, and triglyceride. Triglyceride, non-HDL, LDL, everything is reduced. Total cholesterol is also reduced. Excellent tolerability. This is very important because tolerability of a drug is very important in case of continuation of treatment. Total adverse events is 148. GI related adverse events 25%. Adverse events mild in intensity is 85%. Adverse events unlikely related to STQ is 66%. Hypoglycemia in 10 patients all were ADL level 1. NPDR cases, that is non polyperative diabetic retinopathy cases, 9% all were mild. 
it were unlikely related to HCQ. So HCQ could be an effective and well tolerated therapeutic option for treatment of type 2 DNA. Efficacy of HCQ plus reverse retinol repeat profile in HCQ of patients with TKD with, with diabetic kidney disease. Rosuvastatin plus HCQ. So with excellent results, CG levels were reduced by 25%. LDL CEL for reduced in HCQ group TC declined, total cholesterol declined more, and had significant increase in HCL. CM creatinine declined in HCQ group while it increased in non HCQ group. EGFR was rising in HCQ and decreased in non HCQ. Urinary ACR decreased with HCQ, but continued to increase in non HCQ. So this is a good choice in cases of diabetic kidney disease, along with rosuvastatin HCQ can be added safely. This is in reference to Japi. This is December 2019, of Japi has significantly told us to it can emerge as a viable therapeutic option in the management of T2DR patients, uncontrolled or conventional for NCDs. In this case, 400 milligrams is the approved dose. In combination of diet, exercise, blood, sulfonylurea, and metformin. Hey, these are ICMR guidelines for management of T2DR in 2008. The disease modifying anti rheumatic drug, DMARD, and the dopamine agonist, Promocryptin are approved for use of anti hyperglycemic agent in India. This is approval from ICM. Both HCQ and Promocryptin have been added in their list. Any drug without CV protection is not come, going to Purchase for a long time. CV protection is very much essential. Mechanism by which hydroxychloroquine may mediate its CV effects. There is approval from RSSCI and ESI recommendation in 2020. Hydroxychloroquine is approved by DCGI in the treatment. Type 2 DM. This is Journal of American Heart Edition with HCQ. There's 72% decrease in the risk of CBD with HCQ. It is a retrospective incident RA cohort from January 2000 to October 2013, excluding patients with CBD. Patients were categorized as HCQ 400 milligram users and non users. Well, 66 RA patients were included, 547 users and 719 non users. HCQ 400 milligram per day has a significant protective effect in myocardial infarction, stroke, and transient ischemic attack in Hena's thrombosis. Hydroxychloroquine may be associated with reduced risk of coronary artery disease in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. There is lipid lowering effect of hydroxychloroquine. It is the efficacy and safety of a fixed dose combination of atorvastatin and hydroxychloroquine. A randomized whole brain study is told as reduction in total cholesterol, reduction in LDL, reduction in non hdl the dose was atorvastatin 10 milligram with hydroxychloroquine 200 milligram. It has got antiplatelet action. Those who are getting antiplatelet drugs along with hydroxychloroquine, the dose should be reduced. Hydroxychloroquine efficacy as an antiplatelet agent is heat study in healthy volunteers, a proof of concept study. An ongoing trial, Oxy trial, HCQ for prevention of recurrent CV events in MI patients. In 2000, 
500 patients were hospitalized for myocardial infection. Participants will receive active SQ 300 mg per day or for placebo for at least 12 months until 350 CV events are confirmed. The primary endpoint of composite of death, MI hospitalization for unstable angina, urgent Parkinson's coronary intervention, urgent coronary artery bypass therapy. This is hence Helsinki University Central Hospital sponsor. <clears throat> Estimated primary completion date is December 2009. In, but it is a pilot study, not yet completed. These are global ongoing studies on ACQA in DM. Washington University School of Medicine, Veterans Affairs of Future Research and Development USA. The safety of ACQ. This is rheumatologist's point of view. Long-term partners in 20 years of the clinical experience in rheumatology. Rheumatologists often use HTQ. As published use of antimalarial for the treatment of rheumatic disease for discoid and coronary stone and systemic lupus races in the late 1890s. HTQ has been used in the treatment of RA since 1950s. And more commonly, most recently in 2000, and since 2001, it is regularly used by rheumatologists. It is used in main management of other autoimmune disorders, while well, established roles in dermatology and rheumatology. The College of Ophthalmology 2018 recommendation on screening. Hydroxychloroquine long term and over five years of a baseline examination in a hospital with high department. Ideally within six months, but definitely within 12 months of starting therapy with a original photography. Patients should be referred for an annual screening after five years of therapy. So with 400 milligram dose, regular screening is not much required. After five years continuous use, we can have a retinal test. There is association of hydroxychloroquine with hyperpigmentation also. Incidence is 7.3% after 6.1 years of use, secondary to bruising or atomicis. SQ and hypoglycemia. Long time back, we used to see hypoglycemia cases with chloroquine. Now this hydroxy molecule has come with hydroxychloroquine. So hypoglycemia is very much less in hydroxychloroquine than in chloroquine. Secretagogues which act by stimulating insulin release have higher incidence of hypoglycemia. Anti-diabetic drugs that act by other mechanisms, metformin and glitazones cause little or hypoglycemia. Sun cells with SCQ are extremely less as it is a peripherally to inhibit insulin decreation. In special population, it is contraindicated during pregnancy and lactation. The safety and efficacy is not established in children also. In elderly patients who are likely to have other diseases, it is monitor renal function and cardiac function. Observe caution in patients with renal and hepatic disease, which well established the renal and Regarding contraindication, the known hypersensitivity to 4 amino quinolin group. This is a medicine from 4 amino quinolin group. Those who are sensitive to these drugs, which say G6 PD deficiency, they are sensitive. In retinopathy or pre existing maculopathy of the eye, retin or visual field changes attributable to any 4 amino quinolin. Drug interaction, insulin or other anti diabetic drugs, decrease in doses may be required because it may cause hypoglycemia. Whenever you start HCQ, you will have to reduce some doses of OAC or insulin. Drugs that prolong QT interval and other ethmogenic drugs. Recently, with azithromycin, HCQS 
has produced some side effects like fifty percent risk, but in combination, not alone. Regarding antiplatelet drugs, anticoagulants, caution needs to be exercised. Now we are coming to take home messages. Hydroxychloroquine reduces ASV1 the range of 0.9 to 1.3 percent. Additional benefits on lipids and marginal reduction. Regarding cardiovascular outcome trials, enough evidence from observational studies in RA patients to reduce significance. Oxy trial is going on, ongoing trial in post MI patients. So, in which patients to use? Can be started in any patient inadequately controlled on two or more drugs, including insulin. Diabetic retinopathy and hydroxychloroquine toxicity have different pathways. Real risk of retinopathy is only after five years, only one percent, and after ten years it is only two percent. It's very much negligible. A A American Ophthalmic Association recommends initial ophthalmic evaluation with one year of starting history. Once within one year you go for a checkup of retina, then after five years you can reset. In absence of risk factors, subsequent ophthalmic evaluation can be done in patients receiving HCQ for five years. If used for five years, include <laughs> as the OCT in annual screen. So thank you very much. So Thank there you. Are, there are a few questions. Thank you, Doctor Mr. Doctor Madhav Mitra, uh, for covering the topic very nicely and a very simplified way. Regarding hydroxychloroquine, it's a very safe drug. Here. As you have told, the only problem is the QT prolongation, the major side effects which everybody is talking these days. Otherwise, it, it has been even proposed for. Prophylaxis in the COVID. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitra. I think we can go for the question and answer. Sir, so uh, there is a question from Dr. Bimrendu Saha Zorhat. We are asking about role of food in DKD grade to normal BMI. Age is patient. Age is sixty-four. You can also see the question chat box, sir. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Bimlendu Sahai is asked. Uh, what is the question? Role, Role of food in DKD grade 2, normal uh, BMI, age is 64, male patient. Role of food in DKD. Diet in DKD yes. is mainly, mainly protein restricted. And HTQ, I have already shown in this slide, the HTQ can be easily prescribed with olozubastatin. We are showing that there is reduction of creatinine and ACR in case of hydroxychloroquine treated patients. But diet is something different. It get to, there are not much, much restriction of diet. Protein should be restricted, otherwise, Patient can take a normal diet in small amounts. This is great to only. Yeah. Dr. Madhav Mishra, you can also cover this your clinical experience of hydrochloroquine in diabetes. Dr. Anjan Bhardo from GMCH Guwahati is asking. Uh -huh. If you have your clinical experience of hydrochloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine 400 milligram is well tolerated. We can continue for as long as we want. If there is reduction of blood sugar, say showing hypoglycemia in some cases, then you can reduce other doses. Or in some cases, you can reduce to 
200 milligram daily of hydroxychloroquine. But you can continue for longer period period of time. There is no harm. We want the blood sugar to be controlled. If it is not controlled with two drugs or insulin, we are adding hydroxychloroquine 400 milligram daily to get a good glycemic control. Once we get it, we can continue with the same dose we to reduce dose of insulin or other OSA, or we can reduce hydroxychloroquine to 200 milligram daily also, in some cases. So there is nothing. We can continue as long as you want. Yeah, yeah. So even Dr. Saurabh Iswas was asking how long can hydroxychloroquine can be used. So you have answered it. And now the question that to Dr. Agarwala, Dr. Vinit Prasad from Siliguri wants to know. Yes. Is hydroxychloroquine prescribed to all diabetic patients with prophylaxis in this COVID No, no. Case, hydroxychloroquine as such has not been uh, advised Vinit, to give pro Agarwala, prophylaxis. Can you Hello? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, hydroxychloroquine as such has not been prescribed for prophylactic use. They have been for treatment of uh, diabetes, they have prescribed hydroxychloroquine, especially in those cases which is not responding to other oral anti hypoglycemic drugs. But as a prophylactic, <clears throat> perhaps it is not prescribed. Yes, because even as ICMR also is asked for prophylactic, you can use it for asymptomatic health healthcare workers or those. Uh, asymptomatic household workers who are having COVID patient in their house. Yes, uh, that is there. Regarding profile, yeah. So I think there are not much questions because. Pradeep sir, your been... video is probably paused. Oh. Okay. Rahul. Take me round the video. It's a video for the video. Start my video. Yes, yes, no, yes. Busy. Busy. So I think all the subjects were covered very nicely by Dr. B.D. Agarwal and Dr. Madhav Mishra. So, there are no more questions. Probably, we have been in for last four months attending so many seminars, so everybody is <laughs> confident and having lots of knowledge about this, these products and COVID. So, Asim, you can continue. Yes, sir. So this is the few questions till now, sir, we received only. Okay. So thanks for uh, addressing all the questions, sir. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Pradeep Jain, sir, Dr. Vijayagarbha, Dr. Madhamishra, sir. Thanks for joining us. So hopefully see you soon after this, this pandemic, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you to all the ISTA family. Thank you, sir. We have brought us together in such a COVID era where we can't meet each other, but we have brought us at least in the platform where we can see each other and we have we could find new friends. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Stay, stay safe. Stay Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you. Be sir. safe and keep other safe. safe. I think we can be goodbye. Yes, sir. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank, Thank you. Sir.